Hey guys, welcome to Cisco Nate. So uh, today's video is about how to enable client certificate authentication on the FMC. And if you're a repeat viewer, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support me, it'll help raise awareness of this channel. Uh, if not, that's okay. Hey, that's what I'm here for is just to teach you guys how to do things. Now this video is pretty prescriptive uh, and while it may seem simple that you just check a box and you use certificate to authenticate, there, as always, are some nuances to this configuration uh, which have to do with how you can generate the certificate and what certificates become available in the browser to be submitted for client authentication. So we'll go ahead and get right to it. I'll see you guys in a few. All right, the requirements for this video are that you need access to a PKI certificate authority infrastructure. And the infrastructure has to be the same authority that generated the web HTTPS certificate for the web server of FMC. If it is not, then the FMC will not be able to verify that client. So many of you have typical infrastructure that will issue certificates or web servers, but the user certificates, especially for CAC cards and other uh, PIVs uh, may not necessarily be the same, but I'm warning you now, if it is not the same root CA, the FMC will reject the client certificate. So that aside, uh, you also need to have access to the certificate store to insert your new user certificate or just have a normal infrastructure where as user certs are created, they get automatically deployed wherever you log on, or you need to have a CAC card and that is dynamically loaded when you insert the card into the PIV. Uh, you also need software for this particular video to generate this CSR for the cert. So request the user certificates. Uh, and then you also need a browser to test this. And finally, you need an FMC. Okay, we'll get into configuration now. All right, guys, we'll start this out uh, as I almost always do. The first thing I'll do is I'll go get the uh, software and or configuration items that I need. So I'm gonna to go to the resources that I'm providing you down below in the description here. And I'd recommend you do the same. Go to the YouTube video resources and the FMC client authentication resources. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this CNF file and I'll get into uh, more of what that is and what it's used for later. For right now, just go ahead and download these files. All right, so I've downloaded both of those. Um, and what I'll do next is I'll go to my FMC and kind of show you the current baseline. And that is that I have an HTTPS web cert installed and running from the other video, which you should see a card for right here. Um, and that's where I first uploaded a certificate to the FMC for it to use to validate itself to you as you're logging in. Hence this lock here showing that this is a properly validated HTTPS website. Now, in this case, I used my own certificate authority, which is likely what most of you will be doing. So I'll come to configuration, we'll go down to the HTTPS certificate and you can see where my current configuration stands. <clears throat> okay, so you can see that I issued a certificate that identifies my web server on the FMC via the DNS name I have entered. And it's of course using my Cisco Nate domain, was issued by my Cisco Nate root certificate authority and has subject alternative names so I can access the website via the IP and the URL successfully. Now, enabling client certification uh, certificate authentication is as simple as checking this box and hitting save. I say it's simple, but it's actually very dangerous. If you check that box and hit save, you will then be locked out of the FMC if you have either misconfigured something or don't even have a certificate deployed yet. So do not do that yet. I just wanna show you, I don't have it enabled yet. All right, so what's the first step? The first step is we need a certificate that is available on your machine. And that certificate is typically modified, manipulated, or edited through certmgr.msc. So when I open this and I open up my personal certificates and look at the personal certificate store, I do not have an identity certificate for me, one that identifies Nathan C. Stapp. Now you see a bunch of other certificates. These were all put here by other software, or whatever, for usage on in their own aspect. But what you will notice is that most browsers will not offer to allow you to use just any certificate that is in that store. If you come down here to manage certificates, you see the only one that's available is the token signing public key. So what's different, you might ask yourself. The difference is the token signing public key has the private key embedded or bundled in this certificate store. And that is key to being able to use your certificates. 
If the private key is not bundled, it will not show up here and be presented as an option for you to authenticate to any server that's requesting client authentication. And therein lies the rub and the complexity in configuring client authentication, especially if you're an engineer and you don't have a lot to do with the PKI authority. All right, so we're gonna get into that now. <clears throat> I have this great software um, that I recommend for you and we need to go get it as well, just like all the other software or files that I provide you. And it's from a guy who publishes software on a website called Shining Light Pro Web. And it's a Win64 port of OpenSSL. OpenSSL is the de facto standard for modifying, manipulating, generating certificate CSRs and certificates themselves and anything else you want to do. So the one that I'm going to download and install is the Win64 because that's my operating system exe and it's going to be the developer version, the 63 meg version. So I'm going to go ahead and download that here. I'll we'll finish here in a second. He has a nice blazing fast upload speed, which is very nice, especially when I'm trying to make a video like this. All right, once it's downloaded, I'm going to go ahead and install it. So I click run. I've already installed this once before, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again just so you see the whole process. Click accept, next, next. Go into the Windows system directory for the OpenSSL DLLs and install basically all the defaults. Now, this is going to overwrite the other installation, which is perfectly fine. I want you guys to see every single step involved so you can replicate this as easily as possible. Now, if you don't have software to do this, that is fine, it's not a big deal. Most of you will likely go to your PKI authority and ask them for a user cert, or you'll have one in a CAT card or a myriad of other things. But again, the key is that cert has to be issued by the same authority that issued your web server FMC cert. All right, now you can donate, which I did the first time. I'm going to uncheck this box now, and I'm going to hit finish. I've got all the software I need downloaded, installed, and I'm going to go ahead and launch that. So if I come down here and type Win64. You don't need to run it in privileged mode. Note the user directory that it's currently in. This is where you need to put your configuration files, and this is where the output from this tool will be. So I'm also going to open that, and I'm going to navigate to that directory so that things are easy. I'm going to come down to Users, Ceratos. <coughs> you notice there's nothing here. So the first thing I'm going to do is open this conf file. So the nice thing about OpenSSL is it allows you to use what are called configuration files, which help skip through all of the tedious typing, mistyping, backspacing, all of that, and allows you to reuse a common template that you know works. So this is one that I've provided you, so that all you have to do is replace what is in between the carrots here. Now for a user cert in particular, there's only a few fields you need. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my email address here. I'm gonna go ahead and identify myself and the, the actual name or identity that's put here is not super important. The important thing is that the FMC trust the root authority that generated it. You could call yourself Jim Bob and still it would validate you as long as it was issued by the CA. See, the certificate authentication isn't actually validating, for the most part, the exact information in the certificate. In this case, it's just checking trust. Now, there's other advanced options with like ISE and 802.1x where you can actually check these other fields, these other metadata attributes. But in this case, it is literally just checking does it trust this certificate, i.e. was it generated by the root authority that it trusts. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my Cisco name.local. Again, I provide examples of exactly what you need to put here. And there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and save this as usercert.conf into that directory where the OpenSSL is going to be looking for this information. So. All right, now that we have the usercert.conf configuration file completed for OpenSSL, I forgot to actually download one more resource uh, from my drive, which you guys are also provided. So you've got the configuration template. The next thing you need is the command that will actually generate your CSR. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and take what is provided and put it into a notepad. And that allows me to do the replacements of what I need here. So I'm gonna call this, so I'm clear, usercert.csr, because this is for my user cert. I'm gonna call it usercert.key. 
And then I'm going to point it to the configuration file that I completed, which I believe is, again, usercert.cnf. It's nice if you just kind of name everything consistently. Yes, usercert.cnf. And remember, that needs to be in the user directory, which OpenSSL is looking at. So users, Serato's in my case. Here's usercert.conf. Now I'm going to take this line, and then I'm going to go back to this command prompt. Now click in the window to make sure it's in here. Right click at top. I always run into this. Control C. Oh my gosh. Paste. There we go. So this should successfully output my CSR, which I then have to take to my PKI authority, my root CA, to give me a certificate back. And it should also generate the private key, which is extremely important, and you will need to use that again later. So let's see. There we go. Great. So now that that executed, I should be able to come back to this directory, and all of those items should be here, which they are. So the first thing I want to do now is take this certificate and open it up in Notepad so I can copy it and submit it for a certificate on my PKI authority. Now, many of you would probably just provide this certificate to your PKI authority and they'd go about their job doing it for you, but I'm showing you the prescriptive 100% way to do this from soup to nuts, so here we go. <coughs> now, it's important that you have a properly formatted template to use to generate this certificate, and that adds a lot of extra metadata that's pertinent to your environment. I cannot tell you exactly what that needs to be for your environment. That's what your PKI authority guys are for. But in general, for mine, I use the domain user. I'm going to go ahead and paste my certificates signing request here and hit submit. And I want to take base64 and I want to download the entire certificate chain. Now this is important because it includes your root CA, the user certificate, both of which you will need to do this correctly. All right, so I'm going to close that window out. I'm going to go ahead and open up this certificate chain, and now I'm going to extract those certificates. One is the root CA certificate, base64 encoded. I'm going to put it in the same directory all the other files are that I'm using with OpenSSL because we're going to need to use OpenSSL to manipulate this one more time before we can put it, uh, make it available in the web browser. And what you call it doesn't matter. It's the name in the certificate that matters. So I'm going to call it root CA. That way it's easy for me to remember and identify. I'm going to put that in that directory, hit next to export. Next thing I'm going to do is same thing with my user certificate. I'm going to export, next, base64 again, next. Go to my user, C, users, Cerritos, and I'm going to call this user.cer and save. Next, finish. So if I go back to this directory, I should now see a CSR configuration file key, the actual user cert that was generated and the actual root CA cert that was generated. Now comes the last step, and this is where you need to take the final resource I give you, which is the user cert conversion OpenSSL example. All right, so we're gonna take all of this we're going to paste it into my notepad that I'm using as a workspace, and I'm going to replace everything in the carrots. So my certificate, rootca.cer. I'm going to take the user cert. Now, if you have more than one CA, say an intermediate, a three-tier hierarchy, a root, an intermediate, and the user, you need to have that here in between. So you need to build the chain from the root certificate all the way to your user certificate. And you have to have the user certificate directly preceding the cert key. If you put these out of order or try to go with the user cert first, it will tell you can't identify any certificate that matches the encryption key. That's because this user cert has to directly precede the key that is associated with it. Otherwise, OpenSL bugs out and it gives you a somewhat misleading error. The key does match one of the certs, but it's not in the right order. So again, if you have an intermediate certificate, place it here in this gap following the same pattern. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put user cert.cer because that's what I called it. This one was called user cert dot key. Again, we just want to look at our directory and make sure everything is correct. I'll put it over here for reference. We have root ca dot cer, user dot cer. We have user cert dot key. And the final thing is you want to make this whatever you want to call it. It really doesn't matter. And I'm going to call this user bundle dot pfx. Now this command when executed takes all of these certs 
and the key and bundles it in one PKCS 12 formatted PFX file. Well, let's see if I can get this pasted in here. I always have issues doing this. Oh, great, it worked. So I should be able to hit enter here and I'm gonna go ahead and type in a password to secure my PFX bundle. Now you can see it generated a user bundle.pfx. So there's a few ways you can go about now making this available in your user trust store. You can either come to cert manager, which I left open and click on personal certificates file or all actions and import, or the easier way is just double click it. And now I'm gonna import it to the current user because this is to identify you as a user. I'm gonna tell it this is my file, the PFX. I'm gonna give a password for the private key and you wanna mark the key as exportable. This just makes it easier down the road if you need to do anything else. Uh, you don't have to do this, but I'm doing this for this example. Now this is technically not secure. In general, in production, you do not wanna make the key exportable. But if you don't do that, then you won't be able to back it up. So in production, don't do this. I'm doing this for now. I'm gonna head and hit next, and I'm gonna place all the certificates in the personal trust store. Hit next and finish. Now it says the import is successful, and that means over here I should be able to refresh, and there we go. We see my root certificate CA, and we see my certificate. Now notice the key is here. This means this has the private key, and that means it should also be exposed and available now via my browser. So let's close out all these windows. We're done with all of the manipulation back and forth and certificate stuff. Don't save, close, close, close. Let's close out the cert manager and the rest of these text files. And we're going to go ahead and verify that this certificate is now available in Chrome before enabling client cert authentication. So here it is. <coughs> it is available. Chrome recognizes it. It's shown up here. This is great. I'm going to go ahead and hit close. And now we're going to bite the bullet per, per se and come back here and enable client certificate authentication. Now I'm not going to enable any of these advanced options right now. I can do that in another video. We just want to make sure this works. I'm going to go ahead and hit save and enable. Now remember, if you do this and you've improperly configured this, you will lose access. There is a method for reversing this change via CLI should you have erroneously checked this box and locked yourself out, or you have an incorrect certificate and locked yourself out. Now, you can see it has identified me. It pulled up a certificate. I'm gonna hit OK. And as long as it's successfully authenticated, we're good. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out of here and close the browser entirely. I wanna make sure 100% that there is no issue that's happening here, no caching of credentials, because I wanna be absolutely certain this certificate works. Now I'm gonna come back to FMCA, try to access this, hit OK, and there we go. I have successfully authenticated using my certificate. Again, it's not validating the actual user, it's just validating that it trusts it was generated by a valid root certificate authority. So I'll log in. We have now successfully configured client authentication as well as web server authentication on the FMC. Hope you guys have a good one. I'll see you next time.